Um, thanks so much for coming out on such a wonderful night, uh, weather-wise, to our uh, meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rod and Linus Miller. Um, they just joined, they're at the very back there. Thanks for becoming new members. And uh, Rod, Rod is keen to get up on the hill, so they're both going to be active on the active observers list. and we. Hope that the weather will cooperate the next time, and uh, that this is great news. Um, uh, before I start, this is a members' night, so all of the people with their presentations, if we could come down now and we'll load them on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Center members. And then afterwards, uh, everyone usually goes up to the fourth floor of the Elliott building where we're for tea and coffee, and where we have further dialogue yes. and chit chat. And there's a, an astronomical library up there that you're welcome to take up. So I hope you'll join us and follow some people up to, up to that area afterwards. So uh, uh, I, I guess there was old news, but I can't quite remember what it is. Uh, it might be that we did have a, a, a very successful um, uh, astronomy day on the 27th uh, at the museum, followed by uh, quite nice weather up on the hill for uh, the first star party of 22 that we're going to hold this year at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. And I'd like to thank all of those people who uh, 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 work to not get there to make it uh, all possible. So for the uh, announcements, um, let's see, uh, we'll go announcements and an upcoming event. So um, my name is uh, Rez, I'm the president and I have nothing to say. <laughs> the vice president is too busy to talk. <laughs> The, the, vice, the second vice president hasn't been seen in months. Um, the identity of the vice president was identified, however, in the, the, the latest edition of Sky News in the crossword puzzle. Uh, it was six, letter, six letters. I thought his name was vacant, but uh, it, his name was nobody. So <laughs> that's the. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if, if this is a bit of an issue here, um, right now uh, we, we uh, don't have a coordinator of uh, volunteers, but a second vice president or president, uh, or um, the vice president, and so I'm starting to run out of gas here, so I might need some help sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but Bruce, uh, I, uh, I alluded to your excellent addition here. Have you any comments? Yeah. Yeah, no, we cut it out today, uh, or basically Sunday. It was kind of a short, short compressed editing from the since the lead articles for Swami Day, so it's a little longer. Uh, I mean, usually the bulletin doesn't beat me to public publication, but it's time they did. 
good chance, which is unfortunate since they use the same photo as I did for the story. Jim, you now. Uh, there's only one typo in the entire thing that's not in because I did the crossword puzzle last because it has to be based on something, like all the things have been written. So maybe one half, one uh, uh, answer is actually in the crossword due to software glitch that I didn't catch. So it's doing it that last minute. That's my first night. <laughs> so that was one move that would get past me eventually. So yeah, the, the next month we'll have another story in the uh, on the 200 inch test, so that'll be next month. And I haven't gotten the person to interview yet, but so someone might be getting it. I should say if you haven't checked out the article on um, aperture fever. It's a classic, a tremendous, juicy historical article, and even delves into the Irish astronomy mafia. So don't, don't miss it. It's a great, great, a great read and a great magazine. So thanks very much again for our wonderful new site. Um, Deb. It's $13,211.91. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Chris, membership? So the current membership is 285. And, and uh, we have 22 people in the grace period. So, okay. Yeah. And two of our newest members are here tonight in the Glennon membership system, so that it's all starts. Okay. So I think that it's our newest member. <laughs> I was walking last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, last last month, that was premature. You know, you have got a three months of great respect. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, David Lee is not here, but uh, he was the, the person who uh, made Astronomy Day uh, really happen, and Dave did a terrific job organizing it. And uh, his work, he's writing down the procedures so he can come up with kind of an astronomy day template event to make it easier uh, for people uh, to, to uh, resume that job later. And that's just one of several of these things we're trying to do. We're trying to, in the end, have a, an operating manual that will have particularly uh, uh, how to uh, lists or documents for astronomy day. Uh, our uh, annual star party and also, uh, how to run an AGM and set it all up. So uh, uh, it will be a piece of cake for the next person to take over as president. So there you go. Um, Sid is not here. The, the, the school program is uh, astonishing. Uh, when you last talked to them, there were 86 classrooms they uh, went to. The next day they went to two more. So he's uh, pushing a 90. Uh, classroom market, and it's just an extraordinary effort that uh, uh, mainly uh, Sid and uh, Lori Roche do, but also often assisted by a few others as well. Uh, technical committee, Matt? Uh, the technical committee will be meeting, uh, well, everyone who arrives uh, will be meeting after this uh, meeting tonight uh, to discuss next steps on the collimation of the telescope. Uh, that's the primary focus. Uh, we've not resolved that. We've not resolved the PC. Um, there are an outstanding list of uh, to-dos. Okay. Um, so that'll that's be uh, it's going to be held here uh, shortly after. I should mention that there's some chairs empty here because there's a Mars show on at the Royal Theatre tonight, and I know a number of people, including David Lee, are at that event tonight, so that has depleted some of our attendance this time. Joe, website? Uh, no report, really. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, observing, Michelle is <coughs> here. Um, uh, Nelson, uh, he sent his regrets. And I still have some leftover stuff about uh, uh, Vancouver Island Regional Science Fair that you said. Um, well, we, we should have uh, mentioned that uh, uh, William, one of our members, is here. And uh, William uh, has been very active. He's been at the last two star parties with his telescope. 
and he's been at the Astro Cafe, so I'm really glad that he's uh, become so engaged in our, uh, our astronomy program, so welcome to him. So upcoming events, uh, Astro Cafe is every Monday at 7.30 p.m. in the Fairfield Community Center uh, near the University of James Douglas School. The last cafe of the season is on May 27th, uh, coming up soon. Uh, uh, next uh, cafe, one of the people we'll be talking is uh, Janine McGillivray, as well as being a, a member of the Victoria Center. She is also a very active member of the Nanaimo Astronomy Society, and I would be looking forward to her talk. Uh, the Saturday start parties are uh, on until September 7th, and people are having trouble getting uh, um, tickets for it because it's a, a popular event. Um, I noticed that the last, even though the weather was quite good last uh, um, a session, there were about 60 no shows. So uh, uh, there is some possibility of people, if they do arrive late, they might be let up if we still think there's a potential for parking spaces up on the hill. Um, the next monthly uh, speaker will be Matt Williams uh, on Wednesday, uh, June 12th. And uh, Matt is a journalist and he's written articles for astronomy magazine and science and stuff like that. He lives in Victoria and uh, he had a variety of uh, topics uh, that he could uh, present it on. Um, because there's so much interest in exoplanets and people thinking that uh, uh, we just might be able to shop around and pick our next piece of real estate, we might inhabit. Uh, he's going to be talking about the realities involved in trying to uh, send a probe or, or even a human being to uh, a, a nearby uh, star to uh, check it out and possibly colonize. So that, that should be an interesting talk. Uh, on the 13th to 17th of June, it's the RAS General, General Assembly and that's taking place uh, at York University uh, in what used to be the northern extremes of Toronto, but everything's built up around that now. But they do have a subway line there, so if you are planning to go, it's pretty easy to get there from downtown. Um, I, there's one thing missing here. Uh, there uh, was a, an event on July the 4th that's tentatively put in there. And it's the Henrietta Leavitt Memorial Horizon Watch. And uh, some people went to it last year. At that time, it was called the Inaugural Transboundary Fireworks Festival. And a number of us settled down at uh, Clover Point, pointer our telescopes east, east towards uh, Lopez Island, and we have a spectacular uh, uh, view of the fireworks. And we had 10 people out last time, and we all had a blast. So. We're continuing to uh, do that, but we've reframed it uh, into uh, uh, a different terminology here to uh, manage crowd control, I guess. Um, our our RASP Gen, uh, General Assembly, I, pardon me, our IAU, that's the International Astronomy Union, they're going to come up with a whole pile of things this year because it's their 100th anniversary. and. Uh, uh, one of them is a celebration of uh, the land, first landing on the moon by a human, um, and that occurred on July 20th, so they're having the anniversary on July 12th and 13th. Now. On the 13th, they're going to have a celebration up at the center of the universe, and uh, friends of the DAO are going to re um, register that. There might be an opportunity for us to have something, say, at Cattle Point or, or some other place uh, to uh, uh, possibly promote and, and get people out and interested if the weather's nice, uh, the, the moon is in a good position for viewing. Um, then we've got the Labor Day uh, the Sandwich Fair uh, weekend's coming up. Normally we have a, an event in August uh, uh, for the Perseid meteor showers at Fort Rod Hill, but the person who has organized that event in the past has moved to uh, uh, another park, so uh, that may not be going ahead, but uh, uh, if we do find anything, we'll let you know by email. And then, of course, the next council meeting is on September 4th, so that's uh, a while later, a while off, so okay. there we go. There. Um, 
As I mentioned, the uh, uh, New Horizons uh, uh, talk, you can see that it's, uh, uh, there's going to be a table there in Pan, and uh, Lori and I will be setting up the table. I got all the outreach stuff in a plastic tub tonight, and so we're all ready to go for that. So it starts at 7 o'clock, and Dr. Kelsey Springer is one of the senior people on the New Horizons program. And in case you don't know, that uh, JJ Cavallars from the PAO was critical in finding the uh, Ultima Thume object that uh, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft flew by on January 1st. So it should be an interesting uh, talk. There's a, ta uh, a private professional conference on um, at the uh, convention center, um, uh, the conference center all week. Uh, uh, for uh, New Horizons scientists and others to share their events. So we'll probably get the latest breaking news from uh, this talk. So it should be really interesting. We hope to see you there. And that's it. So uh, I'll just mic up the first presenter. <laughs> We've got a person coming in who's going to be making a presentation. <laughs> Hi, Lori. <Hi. laughs> Am I on? Yeah, yes, yeah, so you just, this is just beautiful. Segue is perfect. <laughs> We would like to uh, introduce uh, Lori Roche, our uh, Mass Service uh, Award winner, and uh, also uh, a very, uh, she's got divided loyalties to, between both the, uh, the um, uh, Victoria Center of RASC and something called the Friends of the International Physical Observatory. Many of you are probably members of both groups. I consider myself an unfriendly rascal because I haven't joined that group yet. But uh, Lori is going to come here and demonstrate something. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Sorry if I'm, I'm late. Would, would you like to get that microphone? Um, sure. Probably a good idea. From the um, from the museum. Sorry. Nothing. Do you want me to turn off the mic? Well, uh, the mic's fine. Just the noise is gonna be the only thing we hear. Apparently, it was the assistant who was the problem, not the mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, last year, when the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory had its hundredth anniversary, um, the Royal BC Museum. Uh, spent quite a considerable amount of time and effort um, in, in supporting the uh, in supporting the the RASC and the DAO in making a wonderful exhibit that is up at the center of the universe. Many of you have already seen it. If you haven't, make sure that you get up to see that. It's a it is a, a set of banners that are um, beautifully curated. Uh, with some very historical photographs and really tells the story about um, uh, uh, John Stanley Plaskett and the hundred year old, um, uh, the hundred year old, I guess, um, a journey that the are that the uh, DAO has taken. And so one of the things that they wanted as well to do is to have an outreach kit that would be able to go out to schools that are um, all over British Columbia, because everybody knows that not everybody can get to Victoria to see that. 
The Royal BC Museum does this in uh, with several other kits that they have. In fact, I think there's probably um, maybe 10 or 12 of them. And they have been uh, worked on over the past few years and they go out to the schools. And so the, so a school would say, hi, I want your kit on, on biodiversity or another one that they were doing was on the reconciliation, Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And there were some other, there's some others on invasive species. And they, they, the teachers will say, hi, I would like your kit. And then they mail them, they mail these things out to, out to the groups and they keep them for, you know, up to two weeks, sometimes a month or so, and then and then bring them back again. So they wanted to do something with the DAO because they didn't have anything um, that was in that was in that same range, um, that same range at all. So they hired a contractor uh, to who was a teacher actually up at uh, Queen uh, Queen George School, Queen Queen Margaret School. Margaret, in Duncan, in Duncan, Duncan. yeah, oh, sorry, King Art, and and they hired this um, this lady to come in and do some work at finding out what we could put in the kit and how it could be put together, and then uh, and it it took a lot longer than people thought. They would really wanted to have this out during the year of in 2018, but it didn't quite make it. But that's okay because we now have got it for forever. So what we have done is this: the kit that we have here then can go out to any schools within British Columbia. And so if any of you know uh, friends or um, relations in other parts, in maybe you know, some other more central or northern areas who would like who, who teach or who have kids in the schools and they would like that, please just let us know because we'll make sure that we get we get all that out. It will be on our website. We're just we're just getting things kind of organized for getting this out. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about what was in the DAO outreach kit is what I was trying to do. So, okay. So in here, there are, uh, I don't need to take up all of these, but let me show you one. You never know what you're going to find. Whatever. <laughs> This is all really quite very, very nicely oops, published and put together. And this one's going to get this out. And I'm wondering how many of you are familiar with the Galileo telescopes. Any of you? These were, these are what the. Um, I guess the International Year of Astronomy put together for uh, for giving out to schools, giving up to people um, in 2009, and they made thousands and thousands of them. It comes in a kit, and the people who get this have to put it all together. Now I have three of them. They're actually they what they did was uh, originally they thought that they would give each one of the schools a kit and say here put it together. But in fact, it's a little tricky, um, especially trying to get all the, the lenses in in the right place and to make it to make it right. So what they did was they actually made three of them. Um, how many of you have actually looked through one of these? Yeah, couple, yeah. Okay, a couple. Of, I can send these around if you want to. Um, if you want to find your focus, it's this part that comes out, and um, and this is basically a, a, a rendition of what. Galileo's te telescope was looking like that's the you know that's how big his telescope was back in 1609. That's the the diameter of the uh, the diameter of the telescope. So I can send I can kind of send these around, and if you'd like to have a have a quick look through, I don't know whether you're gonna because I actually see quite a lot. I mean, I can, if I'm standing on the CU deck, I can see right over to Anacortes. Uh, not in, uh, sorry, in, uh, to um, Port, Angeles. Uh, Port Angeles. I can see right over to Port Angeles with one of these things. Like it's really quite amazing. Anyway, okay. So those, so that, so this is really what the kit kind of looks like right here. There is a, there is a, uh, a guidebook that has seven full lessons in it, completely right down to some pages that you can print off to give 
uh, to give to the kids. There's a whole section on the actual lesson plan, what you do, and then all the further, all the further learning and further resources, and it goes through all kinds of stuff. I'm not certainly not going to go through that, but I did want to go through two or three um, of some of the really cool things that are in here, so that you get a chance to see what's going on. So the first, the first thing they did was one of the first lessons was what the solar system looks like. So. In each one of these bags, there's five bags, and they just simply put out, I'm, I, I'm gonna come away from you for a minute. Is, I, oh, you're not gonna be able to see me, right? Okay, is this lady has made felt, felt, um, um, completely felt, felt planets. And um, this one was, the yellow one was um, Saturn. And Diane Bell and I took one look at it and said, that doesn't look like Saturn at all. So Diane just made, so made, made, uh, made rings. So we've got this. And then, and then there's, there's, uh, there's Neptune and, and Uranus. And then in here, because she's tried to really keep everything so that there, there's a kind of a standard, a standard size. And so here's all the other little ones. So what the kids what the kids are doing is kind of trying to kind of put them in you know, some sort of you would give the you would give the kids these packages and then they would put them in they would put them in the order that they are. And these are these are um, the the relative sizes of all the of all the planets. So you can see that things could get lost really easily, <laughs> but that's okay because it's really very cool. It all each one of the bags has got has got some of these. So, so these have all been made, you know, by somebody that she knows, and they, that she made all these lovely these lovely pieces. So that's kind of one of the. This is one of the things that they that the kids can do, and then there's also in um, in another little little bag here oh, oh sorry uh, then then what they have is that you're to blow this up to be the sun so you have to they kind of showed you how big to make the sun so that it would be that it would be um would be that much so they thought they've got some there and then in here they have a set of really nice cards that um, have sets of cards that are all the different plant that are all the different planets, and, and actually they they didn't need all of them, and I absconded with some of them so that we have them up at the center of the universe as well. So they've got some really very nice cards, so the kids can kind of match what's going on, and there's a little bit of information on the back of these. So and everything goes into these nice little containers, so that they're all here, and then um, then. In the book, it gives for the kids how far apart everything has to be on this black, on this, on this black thing, like with a, with a, with just one little tiny bit of tape. It kind of shows you how how much they have to they have to put them beside. So, um, so that will be your trick of the day is to try to see if you can put them all in the right place. Okay. Okay. So that's so that's uh, that's one of the lessons that they have, and there's lots of other there's lots of other kinds of things there to do. So another one, which is which I thought was really cool, was a uh, this was uh, talking about the mirrors. So they they had a whole a whole set of uh, a whole set of things on all the different mirrors that are on some of the some of the um, uh, uh, telescopes that are around. So what they have. Is a I, I need a volunteer. <laughs> Do you want to be a volunteer for me? Okay, all right. Okay, so I want you to stand in the middle here. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to give you one I, another one first. Okay, I'm going to give him this one. And in here, there is a little piece of string. I don't even know whether you can see that. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So, okay, here we go. Hold on to it. There we go. Okay. Now, if you, if he was the middle, this is the radius of the Galileo telescope. So what you would have the kids do is put this down and then go, then kind of just walk around with, it's actually even got a little place 
where you could actually stick a pencil in and then it would go around and it would show that this so this is the di this is the this is the radius and it would show that that little piece of string would be the radius of the Galileo telescope all right so that's where that's where people started from what do you think this one is <laughs> yes Okay. This is the radius of the DAO telescope. So, I'm going to take this one. All right, so what you would have a kid do is to stand in the middle, and you would have, you would have someone who would, like a child, you, you kind of divide them up into groups, and you'd actually make them walk around. Okay, you'd have to kind of come with me. You have to come around with me, but eventually, but by coming around, with me, keep going. Okay, you'd come around, and you would make, you would make the circle. You would make the actual, the actual size of the gal of the gal of the telescope that's on the that's at the DAO. Okay, it doesn't look very big, does it? That's the radius of the telescope. So that so that's kind of that's kind of a neat one. All right. What's this? <laughs> Sorry, I heard it. This is the 30 meter telescope. <laughs> so consider that you've got kids in a in a very large um, space. I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, all the way around. So okay, I'm going to make it a not quite 30 meter, but the same kind of thing <laughs> is he's in the middle, and you have got you have got the the radius that would make a 30 meter the 30 meter telescope. So out of the yard or something like that, the kids could actually go around with somebody in the middle and stand stand around and completely make. Make the thirty the thirty meter telescope. You probably had about Gemini. About so that uh, yeah, we didn't. They didn't do Gemini. But <laughs> that's why you just had it. Oh, we had. Oh, we <laughs> were doing, okay, Gemini. right. We were doing Gemini. But I mean, that would be something else that the kids, if you were doing a grade six class or something like that, then you could just simply go to Home Hardware and say, okay, guys, we need to find out how big the Gemini telescope is. So here we go, and they do a little bit of research. And, and be able to do that as well. So you can you can see that this I mean this is participatory. The kids are actually getting a really pretty good idea of what the size of the telescopes are as to what's going on. And then well this I'll just thank you. Thank you. Is uh, <laughs> there we go? Is then there are there are uh, pages on there are uh, posters that are on the actually on the Chime telescope. And then the Galileo telescope, they've got something here. It's interesting. And then the 30 meter telescope here as well. Um, and then over here, they've got our lovely person, Helen Sawyer Hogg and, and Plaskett, our other for something for something else. So I thought that was really a very um, a very good object lesson about how things, I mean, obviously you you can do this with grade ones and twos to give them an idea, but by the time the kids get to grade five and six, then they can actually start doing some of the um, some of the actual um, you know math that would go around it to in order to find circumference and you know all of that kind of thing. That kind of stuck somewhere around here. Someone there was a little there's a little piece there was a little something rather that it stuck on. Okay. Anyway, that so that's so that's another one. Um, so this is the cool one. How many of you know about the toilet paper unit, the toilet paper solar system? Okay. okay. So they decide what they wanted to do was show the show how far apart things are really are actually. And what you do is you take a regular roll of toilet paper. In fact, there's so many different types of rolls of royal of toilet paper now. And actually, you have to actually find the right one that works. A double roll doesn't work. You have to do a single. Anyway, um, so what they decided to do, instead of giving the classrooms a toilet paper roll that would have to be kind of redone all the time, they made an extra fancy toilet paper roll. So this was all made with this, um, with this piece of, with this piece of paper. So what happens is this kind of, this goes along with, um, um, with this 
is that this completely goes out. And with a, with the toilet paper universe, is what happens is um, starting here where this where at the very beginning where the sun is, then Mercury is going to be one toilet paper page like piece that Mercury is going to be here. Okay, and then then um, uh, Venus is going to be kind of just about maybe one and a half, and then okay, then they they do they can it's in it's in the book you have to look and kind of what what the things are and then they put they put they put Mercury here the little wee tiny one and then they put Venus in the right place they put they put uh, Earth in the right place and then Mars is out a little bit more and then you just simply start to unroll the toilet paper and so that you get to the point where you're then putting, you have to go a whole long way with the toilet paper in order to get to Jupiter. And then you have to go a whole long way more <coughs> in order to get to Saturn. And by the end, by the, by the time that this roll of toilet paper is finished, and you're completely down a very long haul in a school, okay, because that's where you'd have to do it, you'd have to do this, is that you could act, the kids could actually visually see how close you know, of uh, 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 Mercury and Venus and Earth are, you know, in comparison, because these would be, like, these would be kind of just about here, something like that, but Neptune would be kind of out that door and out the hallway. Okay, so you can, like, it really is when, when you give kids an actual, an actual visual sense of how far things are, then that really puts it into their head. But when they see some of those, some of those posters with, that you see all the time on the internet, where you get, you know, the sun's here, and then they go ding, 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 ding. Everything's in a line. It's about this big. You know, they. So we talk about it when we talk when we do the, with the kids as to how something's being photoshopped. I mean, they know that even when they're seven years old, they'll know that something isn't correct scientifically correct, and they'll say, oh, it has to be really far away. But this actually visually. Will actually show them how how far away how far away things are. And in fact, if you'd like to make your own toilet paper universe or a solar system, you just have to go online, and it's just right there. You just like toilet paper solar system, and and they'll tell you kind of how 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 long a piece of toilet paper you need, and you can try it for yourself. So that's so that's so that's another so that's another whole um, like whole part that you would do. And then they have another section on light, and they have these spec the, the spectroscopes. Now, these are better than some I've seen, but they're still <coughs> excuse me, they're still not great. Um, I'm I, I it would be really nice for especially for older kids to really get some really good ones that would actually show the absorption lines. Um, I've tried this up at the center. You know, um, if any of you've been up there in the gallery, we've got a we have a neon like a sorry neon light, a hydrogen light, and a um, mercury vapor. Uh, yeah, thank you, mercury. And and when you put these up to the light, then you can you actually get. The, the actual white, the, what the white light or what the light would look like, and then it actually it breaks into a bit of a spectrum. I can move, I can kind of hand these around if you want to, and uh, and and try them out. I'm I'm still not as convinced about these. And what would these be made of? What would what would be in here? Anybody know what the light would be? The LED type of LEDs? Mm -hmm. okay. They're fluorescent. Okay. So <coughs> they're a fairly broad spectrum. Yeah. So you might but oh like in the in them in them you get a you get a you get the kind of the white light and then it'll break apart into a couple of places. But I still think for grade threes or fours, that's gonna be pretty tough. That it's not it's not as good. I wish we could find if anybody knows anything that's better. <laughs> <laughs> We'd sure like it because it would be really nice. I mean, obviously, it has to be something that can be used by kids and be, you know, kind of rattled around and stuff like that. But um, we'd like to, we'd like to have a little bit more of that. Well, so, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, is, yeah. Really yes. The pieces of the etch lines that make a wonderful impression. But what, but if you put it onto the onto the mercury vapor, like it wouldn't. It's not no. going to. Oh, it would. Do you look through it, John? No. No, you put it. Okay. Okay. I'll I can I'll try that. 
try that and see what yeah. how, what happens with that. Yeah, but those are that's a little it's, it's a, it's a really of something of something like that. Yeah. So so then they then they also have got so they they have one of them one of them is on. Um, is on all the telescopes through the ages. So they're talking about the way that the telescopes right from the time with Galileo. And of course you you put it, if you've got an older class, if you've got grade nines or tens, then you can really, then you can really go all out and do a whole bunch. If you've only got grade threes and fours, you're going to go from, you know, from some of the smaller ones to, to bigger ones and then and then show a few pictures, that kind of thing. There's there's some stuff. And then they also have got the chime. The, the chime in here because they really tried to keep um, to keep that to as much of Canadian content as they possibly can. So there, so in so in here, there's then then there's uh, the whole thing on um, on Helen Sawyer Hogg and and some of the people that have been involved with the DAO and some of the history of it. Um, not a, not a huge amount. Uh, I wish there was a little bit more on it, but that's just me because I. I'm partial to the DAO, but uh, but that's okay. And then the other thing that they have, and which is in here, which are two are two books that are used as um, as um, jumping off uh, jumping off um, places. So Tan's Tan's Moon is a Haida moon story. And it's a, a beautiful, beautifully, beautifully done. I can set, I can hand this around. And all of this, all of the pictures in here have been done with felt. So all these are the moon, like these are all the different moons. Um, you'll know that we, that the Saanich people have the 13 moons. I mean, we have, we don't have 12 moons in a year. We have 13 moons in a full moons in a year. And some, and um, and the different groups of people have gotten to call some of those differently. The 13, the 13 Saanich moons is one. This is the other one, the Sahida. And I will send this around because what the kids did in on, on the Haida Gwaii was they actually made with an artist, they actually made all the felt and they made all these in order to put them in the book. So this is all, this is all being, being made. So I can, I can hand this. I can hand this one around too. So this is that's a that's a that's quite a, a lovely book. It was new to me. I didn't know I didn't know that one. So that was kind of a nice one to do. And then the other one was a was um, an Inuit uh, but about the northern the northern lights and the soccer trains. <laughs> and this is from this is from the this is from the Inuit and is a uh, is quite lovely about what happens when when they when the when the kids were when the kids with the northern lights are coming out, then up in the winter time they're playing soccer in the dark. <laughs> he lives here. <laughs> with now, the, right? Sorry? Michael Kusikak lives here. Now. He lives here. Oh, okay. All right. There so we go. Not going to get to I might be, yeah, that would be that would be really nice to be able to do that. Again, quite lovely, quite lovely pictures um, in this one. So there's two there's two lessons that are on um, that are on uh, that are based on this as uh, based on this as well. And then in the then in the back then they have, um, they have, I think what's really very good is the, uh, is some of the resources that are there. And the last one is, are we alone in the universe? Of course, which is, you know, something that we're really, uh, really looking at. And they talk to the kids about the, the record, the golden record. Um, how many of you went to, um, went to Chris, uh, to Chris Hadfield last night? Okay, I'm the only one. Or two winners. Oh, our winners went. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. They did. Anyway, Chris Hadfield actually had the pick. Had talked about the golden record and some of the exploration. Anyway, so so I think that the museum has just done an absolutely fabulous job of putting this of putting this together. Um, very easily done. Uh, a, per, a teacher would not need to know a whole bunch of stuff beforehand in order to be able to take this do you know, a couple of hours worth of work in order to be able to look, think, take something, uh, take something up as much as they can, um, use as much of the resources as they want to. I mean, obviously you either use them or you don't, and then you can do the, but some of the activities were really quite fun. So what we're going to be doing is putting this out um, onto our website and, um, and it actually, I mean, it actually kind of came through the RESC working with the 
with the DAO and with the museum in order to make that display. I was all part of it, but the FDAO is just because it's up here, we're going to administer it, but it goes out to the schools. So that's what we're going to be doing. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, John. Uh, Laurie, oh. have you plans to use some of these same materials in the school program that you would say? Well, we just already have. <laughs> yeah, have um, just shh, don't tell anybody. Yeah, not yes. I mean, we'll try. We'll different. try to. Uh, uh, yeah, they look like really good. Well, they're solidly, they're solidly made. I think they'll last for quite a long time. And um, and but most of them are done with most of the the uh, things are made so that you would do it with. You know, small, like smaller groups of yeah. smaller groups of kids, and so when we have the school programs up, um, it we it, we're, we're kind of racing between planetarium and and dome tours and things that we don't. But but picking out one activity here for the kids to do would be would be something we're going to do. I oh well, I was too. It was it beautifully put together. I did. Uh, I haven't. I've gone through just about everything, and there are a couple of mistakes, so they are going to have to probably eventually redo the book. But it's nothing that's really major. Mm -hmm. Just this, just, just editing errors, but they get they get that gets kind of done all the time. But, um, yeah, so it's really fun. So come, so come. Maybe what I can do sometime is um, is if on a Saturday night, maybe we can put one of these out and have you know have a group uh, trying something out, and then you can come and play. It. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. Is that, is that my time? That, that, that's about 15 minutes. Ago. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you're as amazed as I am. I did not know what she was going to show. And this is just wonderful. So thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Museum. I'm I'm just the I'm just the messenger. It's them that did uh, them that did the work with lots of support. Um, I, I just like to read the acknowledgement. Okay. The, this resource was written by Tomo Nisha Osawa uh -huh. with contributions from graduate student Dan Posey. Back to the room. You're in this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Peter Brown, who wrote the Northern Star about J. S. Plaskett. Uh, a great uh, biography. Dr. Mary Ann Eightanks of SFU, uh, Dr. Lauren Hammond of the RBCM. He was the main architect of the plastic uh, display. display. Somebody named Lori Roche, a uh, friend of the VAO. And Dr. Jim Hesser, Dr. Dennis Crabtree, and Dr. Sam Samantha Lloyd Lawler. Now, Samantha gave a talk to her uh, three months ago. So, so it's great. What a wonderful thing. Yeah. So thank you so much You're for welcome. sharing. You're welcome. I, just, I, couldn't, I couldn't leave this in the dark, right? I wanted people to be able to see this. So that's great. Now I have to put it all back. Actually, I'll wait till. It, is there somebody that still got the telescope? That is still that's that's okay. Amazing. All right. I'll wait. I'll wait till. Because that actually goes in first. So we'll. Um, did Pluto make it into the collection? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you were. Pluto had a heart on it, so after all. <laughs> but they do have they do have they do have some some stuff on why Pluto was taken out. There is that part of um of it. So I'm gonna try that. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to share something uh, this evening in a presentation? Oh, thank you. Well, I, no? could, I could talk a little bit about what Chris Hatfield had to say. Oh, could you uh, do that? I'm gonna, I've got a little presentation as well. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. At, at, at any rate, so maybe after that, I'll do this. Uh, um, I would normally get the set the vice president to introduce the speaker. I see we have the weather tonight. So, at any rate, uh, uh, this is a talk that I, I gave from uh, in, in part up at the DAO a year ago, and I don't know that many people here saw it at that time. So, 
Right. Wow. Very good. Um, and we're coming up to the opposition of uh, Jupiter. And when I was coming home from the DAO late uh, uh, Saturday night, uh, you could see Jupiter sitting off to the east in a really bright, prominent position. And uh, so I thought I'd give a little bit of a talk about that. And aren't you impressed with that picture of? Uh, Jupiter there. Um, that was taken from my astronomy textbook uh, that I had, and that was about the state of the art in 1967 of uh, Jupiter imaging, and that was taken with the uh, Palomar telescope, not a blue filter. So, so that, that we've gone a long way, and that's part of the theme here. Um, the Galileo telescope, which is recently mentioned, uh, is down here, and you can see these are the actual notes in the uh, journal that uh, uh, Galileo uh, kept uh, 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 when he noticed the positions of the moons night after night. And if anyone has seen the actual uh, manuscript in Florence, it's quite powerful thing to see. It's, uh, it's remarkable. And uh, here is Jupiter in the Great Red plot uh, by John McDonald using uh, Lucky Imaging. And we had a fun night up at the observatory at the VCO using the main telescope there. And John has a whole 24 images of that as the, uh, the, um, the great red spot transits the, the uh, Jupiter. So what we going to talk about Jupiter, uh, just a few things. Uh, some of the things we know, some of the things we don't know. Um, I talk a lot about the Juno mission and how it may help solve some of the mysteries. So uh, one, one way to look at Jupiter and uh, Earth is to compare them. Jupiter is about five times farther than the Sun. Its uh, volume is, uh, diameter is 11 times that of the Earth. The uh, volume is uh, 1,300 times uh, that of the Earth. But its mass is only 300 times that of the Earth, so it's not nearly as dense as the Earth. So it's a gas planet, basically. Um, and we really don't know what's at the core of it yet, but we might find out with the Juno mission. So one Earth year, uh, uh, Jupiter year is uh, 12 Earth years, roughly. But the real thing is that uh, our, we have a 24 hour day, uh, Jupiter has a, maybe a 10 hour day. So it's spinning around so fast that uh, the radius of Jupiter is wider than the north-south uh, at the equator. It's quite a bit, about 10% wider than it is in a north-south direction and that rotational axis. And in contrast to the Earth, which has an uh, inclination of 23 degrees, it's almost vertical, so really no seasonal effects on, on uh, Jupiter. But when you think that it's five times further away, it only gets 1 25th the amount of sunlight, uh, the intensity of the sunlight out uh, at uh, Jupiter. So this has impacts when they're designing a telescope as well, or a uh, space probe as well. Now, Jupiter is closest to that position, which occurs when the sun's here, uh, the Earth is there, and Jupiter is in this position. And this will take place on June 10th, about the time of our next uh, meeting. Uh, so I, I put it now. And it'll have an arc angular diameter of 46 arc seconds, almost an arc minute, so it'll be pretty big in diameter. And uh, it will be 36 light minutes away um, uh, from the Earth at that time. Uh, but it's fairly low on the horizon. Uh, it, the declination is uh, 20 minus 22 degrees. And so, uh, and if you were observing from the Earth, uh, even with our finest telescopes here, the maximum resolution you get is around 3,000 kilometers. Uh, now, on uh, June 10th, uh, Jupiter uh, will rise at 9 o'clock. It transits the meridian at uh, 1 in the morning, and uh, on the June 26th, it will transit the meridian around midnight. So it will be a nice object at the DAO in, uh, in um, uh, late uh, July and August, I think, and we'll be able to really use our new 20-inch uh, 
uh, Dobsonian telescope to look at it at that time. It was a lot of fun to do that. But the one thing is, is that as it transits the meridian, I thought I put it up here, uh, it's, oh, its maximum altitude will be 19 degrees. So it stays fairly low in the sky as it comes across. But it'll be fun to look forward to. Um, so in order to uh, get better resolutions, uh, we did a number of flybys. Uh, you can see uh, way back in 1973, I was uh, still using the textbook uh, where that front picture was from when, when uh, Pioneer flew by, and that was a pretty exciting thing. It amazed all sorts of people. And uh, as you can see, uh, Voyager 1 and 2 went by. A spacecraft you don't probably hear about called Ulysses in 1992. Ulysses was a satellite that was to study the sun, but they wanted to get it above the orbitable plane so it could look down at the North Pole of the sun. It takes a lot of energy to get outside the orbitable plane. So the way, cheap way to do it was to fly it all the way to Jupiter, rob some momentum from Jupiter, and loop it up in the sky, and it parked back towards uh, the uh, sun uh, in that way. So a pretty exotic trip. Then there's a Galileo orbiter and a probe that I will uh, talk about. This is a sad story. Um, uh, all sorts of things that could go wrong went wrong with that, but it still is somewhat of a success. And then Cassini zipped by, and then New Horizons took another look. And finally, in 2016, Juno Orbiter uh, went into orbit around there. So, so it gives you a bit of an idea. And, and to give an idea of the resolution, um, just you can look at the Great Red Spot at, at Pioneer time, Ten Time. When uh, Voyager 1 went by, it had a resolution of 200 kilometers. And uh, when we saw these images, I tell you, this created a sensation in the astronomical community. Um, it, it was just wonderful. And Galileo here has a resolution of 30 kilometers. Uh, get an idea. These aren't all to scale, mind you, but to give you an idea. Some other beautiful images from Cassini. It was a spectacular, where Galileo program went really kind of bad, Cassini was a roaring success in everything. It seemed to be just extraordinary. And some other beautiful pictures uh, of Io, closest moon to Jupiter, um, going by. Um, and uh, there's a resolution from the Cassini flyby on the particular spot. It's gorgeous. And this is, I love this picture. This is, I spent way too much time looking at it. But this shows you that uh, this is, uh, north is up, uh, up here, south is down here, and the great red spot is in the uh, southern hemisphere. You can see it circling around in a clockwise direction. This is important, and I'm going to go into a bit of the uh, atmospherics of the Earth and compare it to, uh, to the uh, Jupiter. But uh, when it rotates like that, that means it's an uh, anti-cyclone. So when people are talking about an old hurricane, the, the great red spots, an old hurricane, they're absolutely incorrect. It's not. But, well, let's say it's an old feature. It's been around for hundreds of years. But uh, the other thing is that you can see a, a progression like this from east to west, uh, right through the center. This is the, uh, the uh, equatorial belt. And then we have some motions going in the opposite direction in these two uh, areas here called, if I got the, it's easy to make mistakes. That might be the equatorial zone and these are the belts. Yeah, the, the zones are white, the belts are brown belts, like in karate. So, so, and then you have another set of zones here going in the opposite direction in these bands that are, uh, so these are the white ones are zones, the brown ones are belts. So let, let's just keep that in mind and we'll, we'll compare uh, Jupiter to the Earth's atmosphere. So I just wanted to show you, here's a, the Earth's atmosphere and this is a, a picture taken by uh, five geostationary satellites all merged together. And we'll just go through a day. Just, and this is infrared, so the darker the area is, is, uh, is the one more day. So as we progress through the day, it cools off in Australia, it's warmer in the Sahara, it starts to warm up in, in South America here. And we'll keep going now. It's cooling off in Australia, heating up some more in this area. And it's starting to warm up in the central US as well. So I'll just go back here. 
forward, back and forward. I just want to see, there's a, a, a series of these hook-shaped things down in the southern hemisphere and a mirror image in the northern hemisphere. And these are in the stream of the westerlies and uh, these systems are low pressure systems uh, near the center of the hook and they progress across the uh, uh, continent uh, in an east to west motion um, uh, here. So let's just step her through and see that. And the other thing of interest is this band of light in here. This is called the intertropical convergence zone. And these areas up here are uh, uh, clear skies uh, and these are uh, uh, reflect areas where uh, high pressure areas are. And uh, so to interpret this some more, we'll just uh, say, talk a bit about uh, clouds to, to infer that <coughs> this all applies to uh, Jupiter. So the question that kept you all awake at night is why don't clouds fall down? Um, they're, they're basically, uh, clouds are formed of uh, water droplets or ice crystals and uh, water droplets are very, very tiny, okay? Uh, and on Jupiter, think of ammonia rather than water vapor. For, there is water vapor up there, but not nearly as much as the other gases on Jupiter. Uh, so very small water drops, uh, the frictional force of rising air dominates the graduate gravitational force. You don't take, take uh, very much rising air to suspend a water droplet. Um, and uh, even the, the, the second, the, uh, the motion of the second hand of that clock is uh, strong enough to suspend a, a water droplet in the air. So the speed, yeah, so there, that's so my time there. So to create a cloud, all you need is some moisture and rising air. But you don't need the air to rise very much. It's one of the reasons that meteorology is a tricky business. Um, prediction of it at any rate. And suspended ice crystals, uh, more, uh, if they grow in the snow, snowflakes, uh, there's a lot bigger frictional element there. It's a lot easier to su suspend a snowflake, and it allows uh, the, these uh, droplets to build up much more rapidly. And uh, to think about it, particularly in our area, uh, all the rain we have was recently melted snowflakes. So for us, one of the things a meteorologist does is he says, well, what's Try and estimate what the uh, predicted height of the cloud. The height of the cloud doesn't get above the freezing level, uh, and then we know it isn't going to generate precipitation. That's one of the things. Or if it does, the only type of precipitation that will generate here is uh, drizzle. So, so there. Now, the other thing is why does air move? Uh, uh, well, the thing is that air is not uniformly distributed on the Earth. And when there's more air piled up, it forms a high pressure area. So there's more air over you, it weighs more as it presses down on you. And the pressure uh, is just that weight. Uh, and if we, uh, instead of a barometer, we had bathroom scales, we could move it around, measure the pressure of the air, and uh, come up with uh, weather maps. Um, so there's uh, less air piled up around a low pressure area. The air tries to flow from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. And uh, the things would normally be really simple if we lived on a rotating circle, I mean cylinder, uh, but we are rotating on a sphere and this complicates uh, things because uh, Newton's laws of motion are only valid on a non-inertial frame of reference and that rotating sphere is, uh, complicates things. It's called the Coriolis force. And here's an example of what it would look like normally because of the, uh, it's called a geographic, geostrophic slow, uh, flow. I won't get into the details here, but um, theoretically, the air will go around in, in the northern hemisphere in a uh, counterclockwise direction uh, around the low pressure area and a clockwise direction around a high pressure area. And the low and the high kind of form a couplet. And, um, so what happens if we uh, look along the line at sea level, and this is a vertical cross section, as air, uh, due to frictional inflow, uh, the air doesn't go circling right around, it actually flows in a little bit into the low and it flows out of the high. So you see the air diverges from the high and uh, coagulates around the low 
and it causes the air to squish together sort of like a hand grabbing toothpaste in the tube and it shoots up. And at the upper levels of the atmosphere, say uh, above 14 or 15,000 feet, it starts to spread out and it spreads out above the uh, low pressure area and it converges at upper levels in the high pressure area. And what this does is it causes the air to sink in the high pressure area um, and uh, uh, and this sinking in the, uh, warms up the air and prevents it from having any moisture showing up. It uh, evaporates any moisture where it rises with a low pressure area. So that's generally why we have cloudy uh, weather with low pressure system and clear skies with high pressure systems. So they, that's why they talk about highs and lows and this sort of thing. Um, it, of course, it's a great sim uh, simplification of things. And, and in fact, actual fact, we normally have uh, uh, cool air coming around the low pressure system that circulates from the north here. And we have warm air and sunny area here, and they converge and they form a thing. Uh, the our region is called a frontal model. They got the terminology from the First World War when this thing can develop. And this thing here is called a warm front. And it usually works around and has a uh, a swirl or a hammerhead, uh, uh, effect like that. So that's a crash course in meteorology. Now let's apply this to uh, the Earth. So what we have here is that these are the low pressure systems again that uh, the Earth is swirling around. Uh, on the southern hemisphere, we're just looking uh, instead of from the top, you're looking from the bottom, so everything is flipped around. But it's the same process. You can see these things will progress across like this. Uh, and these are called the westerlies. We live in a band of the westerlies, which is really a good place to live in some ways because it's a pretty interesting uh, area, plenty of precipitation, uh, quite a dynamic area. In contrast, uh, the areas uh, where the large uh, high pressure systems are, uh, the circulation uh, is such that in the clear skies, the air is sinking and the air flows out here and we have a, a high pressure systems in the northern and the southern areas, and they bring the uh, air together right along the equator, and that causes the air to squeeze together, and we have this warm, warm cloud, which is really basically uh, a line of thunderstorms that are keep continuing 24 hours a day along this region. And uh, as I mentioned, it's called the intertropical convergence zone. Well, with our now, uh, soon our, our, uh, our uh, Knowledge of uh, Earth's uh, ocean, uh, meteorology, let's look at Jupiter. See, in Jupiter, the equatorial zone is sort of like that intertropical uh, convergence zone. It's an area of rising uh, um, uh, air in, in a poor atmosphere right around the equator. And then we have some sinking air uh, around these brown bands here. And uh, so, and then we have uh, these tropical, what we call the tropical zones uh, here, uh, these white areas here are um, associated similar to our westerlies. So uh, with that you can see uh, Jupiter is not the same of us but we're cousins and we have some uh, features that are the same. The other thing is that the great uh, red spot, or there's still a lot of debate about that. Well, one reason that it might be varying in color in that is the a rate at which the air is sinking uh, uh, around that might be a little bit different. If it's sinking um, uh, more rapidly, you might be able to see deeper into that area. So, just something to think about. So, there you are. Um, some uh, things uh, that we don't know about Jupiter. Um, why are Geiger glass planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn banded? Not sure what controls the width and the speed of these jets uh, that uh, circulate across the planet. Um, did these jets extend into the deep interior or are they just shallow? I don't know. And why is the great red spot so stable? It's uh, shrinking, but it's been there for over 300 years. What makes the clouds colored? We're not uh, absolutely sure. And what uh, is the water abundance? We don't have a really that great a measurement of that. Um, and what is the at the core of Jupiter? So, and uh, and what 
creates this huge new magnetic field. So plenty of things to uh, think about, and I'm sure you're all wondering these every day. But uh, as for the flybys, are okay, but we need the orbital missions. So uh, spacecraft orbiting Jupiter can make these more detailed observations over a longer interval. And the Galileo probe was uh, up there from uh, 1995 to 2003. And Juno arrived in the scene in 2016. And for a while, they thought that it would only last for eight orbits. It's just going into its 19th orbit now, and the orbits are 53 days in a row. So we're, we're uh, quite, uh, um, quite lucky with that so far. So the Galileo mission is the uh, dangers of being an early adopter. So uh, it uh, began in 1977 which is a long time ago, and when it was designed, it had basically the microprocessor of an Apple II, uh, 146K of memory. And so it had to use an onboard space, uh, uh, or onboard tape recorder that caused the problem. And it had the first uh, uh, CCD, 800 by 800 pixels. If anybody bought a CD, a CCD about that resolution, I don't know, maybe some earlier doctors here did. <laughs> um, it was planned to be launched on one of the early space shuttles. Good idea, no? Uh, because the Challenger uh, disaster uh, uh, really screwed things up and forced it to change to a lower powered booster rocket. They were going to put up a big booster rocket to send it off. So they had to downgrade the size of that. And it robbed uh, momentum by uh, doing flybys of Venus and the Earth to get to Jupiter. Um, and the Venus flyby was so close to the sun that it may have dried out some critical lubricants that would be used to unfold the upper high gain antenna that they had. Uh, and it failed to deploy. So imagine their main communications antenna was supposed to open up like an umbrella and send all sorts of information back. They, it never did work. And so they had to send all of the, the information back at about 2% of the planned bandwidth. So they didn't get as much information off the machine. After all the mission. And uh, it, it was uh, just a, a mess of going around. To, to make matters worse, the Chernobyl disaster uh, got everyone terrified about plutonium. And plutonium was the source of energy for this device. So it got stalled in Congress whether they could let it go or not. And they just decided, <laughs> they started the countdown anyway. And they got approval uh, in the middle of the countdown to launch this thing. So they were kind of, and they had to launch it at that time to get it in the right position to do all this stuff. So at any rate, so despite uh, all of this, uh, it, uh, it uh, created uh, 33 elliptical orbits in eight years. Um, it actually uh, was uh, equipped with a probe called, um, uh, that uh, was uh, sent into the center of Jupiter, and it quickly burned up in the atmosphere, but it got some data, uh, data from that. Um, and it got some uh, valuable data from the, the moons, and particularly it discovered that the moon Io was 100 times more volcanic than Earth, is Io here, and uh, the plasma from Io set up enormous currents with Jupiter, and uh, this created tremendous radiation belts around uh, the planet. Um, so in uh, designing the Juno mission, uh, they first of all, they said no nukes. Uh, they were going to panel it by uh, solar, use solar panels. Because of that, being 25 only 125 the amount of energy we get from the Earth, the solar panels were huge. Um, and uh, they had a solid uh, dish, high gain antenna, and none of this, so opening up stuff, we're going to try that. And stay away from the sun, so uh, the uh, space shuttle, shuttle program uh, ended, which allowed a stronger booster rocket, uh, just more momentum. Remark, uh, robbing Earth flyby on a, on a five year journey and uh, no probes. Uh, they didn't, instead of uh, launching, uh, dropping a probe into the atmosphere, they instead used a microwave radiometer and gravity science to make more average uh, measurements of the entire uh, planet. 
and uh, a simple spin stabilized design because uh, Juno had a very complicated stability system. And to minimize radiation belts, they took, uh, changed the orbit from a north to south orbit. So it goes swooping down from the North Pole to the South Pole to uh, minimize the time and the intense radiation belts. So, the, so the, this is the uh, magnetosphere here. Uh, so they plan to have the uh, um, uh, Juno uh, spacecraft swooping around in an orbit like that. And um, uh, they, they put a camera on board, but they anticipated it would only last eight orbits. Well, it's going strong after 18 orbits now, so it's working well. So the goals were to uh, investigate the origin and evolution of Jupiter by measuring the chemical abundance and then the interior structure, uh, try, trying to discern it by both measuring uh, gravitational fields and the uh, magnetic fields. The gravitational field would not be uniform. Uh, the atmospheric dynamics uh, and cloud opacity number about 100 atmospheres. Uh, for that, they use a, uh, a clever device, and then they're going to try and measure the magnetosphere in Aurora. There's a lot of Aurora. So the, the main instrument was this microwave radiometer. And, and really, we don't have a lot of information now. But uh, various chemicals will uh, send out uh, uh, signals, and the radiometer picks it up. So four different, uh, or five different frequencies that it can pick things up at, so it can determine a relative abundance. And this uh, this area, a thousand bars means that one bar is the pressure of the Earth. Uh, one barometer, so a thousand barometers. So they they go down fairly deep into the uh, planet, but it's still a long way from the center. Um, so uh, the milestones, uh, it was launched, uh, it went into orbit on July 4th, 2016, and uh, the uh, first approach was August 27th of that year. Um, they had planned to reduce it to a 14-day period, uh, but uh, uh, the Juno went into a safety mode and shut down the instruments just before it was going to do that, and this terrified people. So it's remained in a 25-day period ever since, a 25-day orbit ever since. And uh, the, as I mentioned, the next uh, uh, closest approach will be on May 30th for Perigeo. Uh, this this the, the reason why they're so cautious was they, the uh, the the engine that they used uh, on board was uh, built in Britain, and I I own an MGP and I understand the concern. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the same engine they've been using it successfully for seventy of these things, but the cat speed uh, Venus mission in two thousand and ten. And uh, these three missions, uh, just before it was supposed to uh, fire up the engine, they all used the same control valve that was manufactured in Dublin, Ireland. So uh, they, they had the options. Uh, they could remain in a 53-day uh, period orbit, uh, and, or, and uh, by about 20 orbits, I'm not sure how this is still a factor, they're going to go into the Jovian saddle, uh, shadow, and that means it won't be able to charge up the uh, uh, instruments or the solar panels as much, but we'll see if, if that's the case. Or they could fire the engine and see what happens. Well, nobody has had the nerve to fire that engine, so we're stuck in that at the moment. So originally it was supposed to come into an orbit like this and fire those uh, engines and, and then put it into uh, one of these uh, smaller orbits, but that never really did happen. In fact, it's in a huge orbit like that. And one of the advantages of that, it collects the data, it has more time to do that like back to the Earth before the next round. So one thing that they did put on there is a little melon can, and it was a, to allow amateurs to uh, uh, get the imagery off of this uh, satellite and download it uh, and they engage the amateur community to get involved in this stuff. And there's a really interesting web page where you can look at this. And uh, 
Basically, if you just Google Google uh, Juno can see this thing. But they actually uh, ask people to discuss and vote where they want this camera to point. So we have some input in that. Um, at any rate, it's the image processing gallery that is really quite interesting. And you can spend a lot of time there. But I'll just give you an idea. This might not show up very well. But because it comes very close to about 4,000 kilometers from the surface, uh, the uh, field of view gets very narrow as you get over that, 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 that closest swath. Um, so you can only just see a very small segment of the planet. So if you've got a feature of interest, you have to know where the orbit is and put plan your time. I won't go over this, but that shows you uh, the thing. So what it's uh, doing is uh, the camera is, uh, the spacecraft is rotating with these three fans. It's like a giant ceiling fan uh, rotating with the solar panels pointed towards the Earth. And so the camera is uh, sticking on the side of the body. And so it rotates uh, once every 30 seconds. So for about 15 seconds while it's looking down at the planet, it's collecting the data. And uh, it does that in uh, 35 frames. And uh, so it gives visual channels for one rotation, the next channel is on the methane uh, system. So this is what the, the raw data looks like as it comes down. And uh, this is the first pair of Joe. And you can see uh, the, the width here is about 4,600 kilometers. And uh, remember, the, the finest resolution you can see from the Earth was 3,000 kilometers. Well, we've done, we've done a lot better than that. So they convert it to an RPG image to share this. So this is what they give up to the amateur community and uh, to uh, figure out where it is. I'll show you an example from here as well. Four, um, that uh, it, the image was taken about here, right near one of the uh, uh, the uh, crown belts uh, on the border of uh, one of the westerly zones. And um, what we have there is this is what the, the raw image looks like. And uh, from this, you can I, I used GIMP software. I don't know what I'm doing, but you can enhance it and make it. It's really a lot of fun to do. So if you're Client, all of this stuff is really available, download, and play around. It's the same, man. So, here are some of the images that some of the amateurs, uh, uh, images have been taken. This is true color image of uh, and pair of Joker 7. This is the one where we were, it flew right across the Great Bird Spot, so there's a lot of interest in that. This is another more aggressively shaded uh, version of the Great Bird Spot as it, as it comes across. So, this shows you some of the uh, the uh, views and other weird things show up. I don't know uh, Dorothy Paul's not here. She can normally see biological creatures and things, but that's called the dolphin. <laughs> it just automatically uh, came up. Um, and another uh, beautiful shot of the Great Red Spot and the storm down here. So the Great Red Spot was uh, in an anticyclonic uh, motion. Uh, circling around in this direction, and uh, this is a cyclone going up this, this area. This, they're, 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 uh, they're kind of couplets, uh, like I talked to before. So, and here's another nice one of them showing some uh, turbulence behind the big red spot here uh, in the February 18th orbit. Um, and this is another projection of that. So, uh, at any rate, you can see different ways you can distort the image. It's a real candy land for people who've got some image processing capacity. So, and finally, this is a pair of Joe 19. Didn't generate any nice images because they used a different uh, uh, filter on that uh, thing. It's a fascinating project at any rate, and uh, uh, a lot of ingenuity went into this whole uh, Juno thing collaboration as well as the whole uh, project. So. It's going to take a long time to sort out this stuff. But I should give credit to two of the people who do this. Gerald uh, is from London, and he spent 10 years as an imaging expert, and he did, he just took this thing and ran with it and created all sorts of stunning images with his friend Sean. And uh, at the end of this month is Paris over 30. So if you've got a bit of time on your hands, just go to Google Juno Cam. 
go onto the web and, and uh, download some data and play around. That's it. Okay. So, did you want to give some talks about the Chris uh, Hatfield talk? Yeah. Oh, pardon me, we have a question. Is the reason they use the uh, solar panels instead of uh, using on the car? Because of the fact that they have so little left, I think it's what's only 23 or 24. One, correct me. One is the basically weaponized, and the other is the non weaponized. They're using for probes forever now. Um, but seeing use like the number of five probes, so they kind of lose the story. And they've only in the last year or so started making it again. Well, they, they uh, the new horizon juice is the total new again. So they're going low. But they, they, the main factor of this is that they were traumatized by politicians and that sort of thing. It was an emotional rather than scientific. Any other questions? Sorry? Okay, so uh, last night Chris Hatfield was at the Mary Winspear Center in the big uh, main room. Um, we got tickets late, we were in row U. <laughs> Yeah. All the way back at the back, but it wasn't really too bad. Um, he, I was quite actually quite amazed, to be perfectly honest. He spoke for about 45 minutes and then sang, sang one of the songs with his guitar. And then we took a break. And then he spoke for another 40 minutes after that. And then, they, so we didn't get out of there until almost 11 o'clock by the time you know, it was done, which I thought, I mean, I thought the first 40 minutes and that was it. And, you know, and that was, that was going to be it for 45 minutes. So I was really quite pleased. He's doing this whole tour uh, around to a variety of Canadian, Canadian um, cities. And it is in honor of the 50th, um, part of it is being done you know, through NASA. And uh, so I think he's getting, he's got some money through there. And uh, so the whole idea is exploration. So what he did was kind of go backwards and talk about some of the very first about why people explore, why our our whole group, uh, how people um, got to be explorers, and all the first things that we did. And he did go back um, quite a long way, and he he had a a very good way of kind of showing that um, little little people when they first learn to walk, you know, have to fall down you know, 75 times before they can do it. Or if you're learning to ride a bicycle, you fall off the bicycle a few times before you before you can do something. And that, that, that you actually learn more from failing than you do from, uh, from uh, having something be right. And so that, that is so that in the whole section of, of, uh, of exploring around the world, then it, that really helped, that really helped us. So he was, he was doing some things on, on what it took to get um, uh, people and then and then going into animals and how fast they could go and then getting the wheel and then how fast the wheel could go and then getting into boats and ships and how fast they could go and then eventually the steam train so it took he just he just did a very good job of kind of showing that that build up of exploration um, and the scientific uh, vehicles um, that that we used and then of course he got into the I got into how how they use the spaceships and uh, what he did. He actually didn't. He, he did. He did have some very good. He had some very good visuals on the uh, the roar of the spacecraft going up, and he did a little bit of some some things from of him inside. Uh, but he actually didn't really focus too much on his own on his own work, uh, really, as much as I've seen. Uh, in other in other ways that he did that, um, and then and then he then he talked. Uh, a little bit more um, after about how the the what the exploration will be in the future. So what what they're looking at as to what will what will be next, and that and he used the whole thing that it's really water that is going to be the key part as to what where we go. And so he went through what they think has water, where they think how far away we have to go in order to. 
um, to get to where we would be uh, we would be looking for water and how we would get there. So he showed a few pictures of some very interesting, very weird things that are being made right now. And then he talked about Elon Musk and um, uh, Branson, Branson, right? Branson. Branson, yeah, and and how those are the 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 you know the Magellans and the you know the Galileos of today, and they're they're taking risks. Um, not only with not only, well, they're taking lots of risks with their own money, but they're also taking risks with with resources and and that kind of thing in order to in order to uh, to get something further on. Um, he, he was he was very uh, it, quite polished, but also brought in things. I mean, he talked about you know David Saint Jock um, pulling in the space, pulling in the uh, the, um, dragon. The, yeah, the, I could bring it with the Canada arm. I mean, like you know, two days ago. I mean, he was he was he was certainly able. He didn't just stick to a script. He was able to pull in a whole bunch of things that was happening were happening within the last two weeks or three weeks or whatever. So it was that way. But I mean, he obviously knew what he was doing. It was a well. It was a a nicely done a nicely done um, performance. And uh, but it seemed it it didn't seem slick and polished you know what i mean like that, that you know that they just he's just memorized absolutely everything and he just goes to it it, it, it felt a bit more homey than that and then he played he played uh he played his, his guitar and, and asked, answered questions from the song? um well he did the one that he did on board the ship with uh, or on board the spaceship about with all the children I, um, yes. When he was up there, and he had the 175,000 children all singing at the same time. Um, I can't remember the name of the song. Oh, I remember. I remember it. Somebody's singing. Somebody's, somebody's singing. Yeah. yeah. And then he did the. Uh, then he did the the one with Major Tom at the end. <laughs> and uh, and and, the, and he answered some really good questions. And I thought the and he pulled out a couple of young people in the audience to ask questions from, which was which was really quite which was good. Um, so I, no, it was really I was really quite impressed by what he did. Now Jeffrey and Damien at VIP. So yes, because I saw Mr. Eisenbrandt there. Dirk Dirk was there. He was one of the uh, the, the sponsors. Now, they were allowed but, between five thirty and six thirty to hang out with Chris, oh. and they all they woke up and they were they made. I don't know how they did. We got three autograph autograph copies. copies yeah, they were they were doing that. They were. You know, obviously selling books and, and things like that too, but it was it was packed. They didn't let us into the to the place. Like nine hundred people tried to get all into one place, and they didn't open the doors till about twenty five after seven. And it was supposed to start at seven thirty, so it was rather packed and very hot in the in before they let us in. So there must have been maybe they were maybe they were still cavorting in the back with the with the other people, <laughs> with the sponsors. But anyway, it was, it was fun. It was, it was certainly, it was certainly well worth going. I really enjoyed it. I'm not, I'd not heard him actually in person. I don't like heard him on TV or you know, something like that. So, yeah, it was fun. I think the takeaway of this thing is that if people come to uh, our uh, meetings at uh, UVic, sometimes they get awesome prizes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to call the meeting to a close and say that we uh, return to the fourth floor of the Astronomy Lounge. We're closing